How many people here own an Arduino? Hands up. Oh, good. How many own a Raspberry Pi? All right. How many people own a non-official microcontroller, like an AVR, a PIC, a Texas? Oh, one, three, oh, many. Awesome, I like this. Uh, let's see, what else can we think of? How many own a Beagle Bone Black? One, very good. Um, so we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, that's very good. I'm not started yet, so don't worry about it. I will stay in the light. I will not go to the darkness. You are aware what this is, right? So now I'm, I'm talking to you guys, and I'm making jokes. Uh, I'm from Sweden, so you have heard of the Stockholm Syndrome. If I make you like me, it's less likely that you'll leave. <laughs> that, that sounds like a more dramatic option than telling jokes. <laughs> but if we have any volunteers, I mean, I'm all for it. <laughs> Oh, Poland, this lovely country. Oh, I love being here. This is much better than Sweden. Trust me. I mean, the audience, mostly. You do, you do a few jokes in Sweden, and everybody's like, yes, Carl, that is really funny. Thank you. We now go to Ikea. That's also one of the things, when you're Swede, you have to mention Ikea at least once every time you're on stage. Kind of a social contract. It's not filming yet, I haven't started, I'm just warming them up. Don't worry about it. This is what we will call the Director's Cut Edition. Just a whole minute to go. You know, when I started at hardware business, it was almost never any people that was interested in hardware. And today there's like, like a half a movie theater. I'm just so, so amazed that it's a, it's a very blessed feeling that we have this many nerds <laughs> around the globe. All right. Should we kick this off? Yeah. Excellent. So this is going to be a little bit of interaction in this one. So can everybody just do this? Come on, everybody. Excellent, you can take it down now. Um, so this is the internet of less useless things, in case you are blind and you know, don't want to be in this room or something for some reason. Uh, I'm going to talk, talk a little bit about the way we design internet of things objects and why we might be doing that in perhaps not the most optimal way. Just to give you a feel of what a useless in another thing item might be, here are a few examples. Now, if you think that this thing I'm showing you is a genuine IoT object that has received funding, raise your hand. All right? This is a IoT wine bottle security measure that helps you find out if your wine is a counterfeit wine or not. So is this a genuine product that has received funding? Hands up. All right, about 30%. Very good. This is a IoT cat water uh, drink fountain. It keeps tracks of your cat's drinking habits and makes sure that you know your cat is fully hydrated. Is this an IoT product that has received funding? Oh, almost, almost 100%. Very good. All right. This is the Beat Tweeter. It is a ring that goes on your finger and detects your heartbeats. And should you die, it will send a final farewell to all your Twitter followers. <laughs> is this a genuine product that has received full funding? All right, about 50%, very good. 
Okay, the last one. This is a plastic see-through bottle with an iPhone app where you can see how much water is in your bottle. <laughs> is this a product that has received full funding? <laughs> Very good. All except the ring are true. All except the one you actually wanted to buy are true. This is thing that people have paid a lot of money. None of these are less than $150,000. But I am not going to talk about crappy devices. I'm going to talk about crappy implementations. Because apparently, somebody gave these guys $150,000 to put a ship in a water bottle. So, I mean, we're going, to, we're going to get in on this, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about implementations. So as many of you hopefully know, I work with a lot of hardware development. I'm a hardware guy. I write programs for microchips. Um, which means that I have seen some quite amazing things, especially at my time when I worked with Ericsson. I saw this amazing technology and ideas. The problem is that as soon as I saw something that was cool, this is so cool, I want to do this, I want to show this to the world, they all went please sign this NDA that regulates whether you can breathe or not next to somebody who isn't hired by the company. All right, that's a bit of a problem, which means that I mostly just travel around talking about how to make hardware work, the things that I actually can talk about, my education. But earlier this year, me and my girlfriend did something that, you know, all grown-up couples do eventually when they got to know each other quite well. Um, we bought a house. <laughs> um, and I was so, so ecstatic because finally I was going to do all of these hardware projects. I was going to do IoT in a th place where nobody can put an NDA upon, upon me and say, you can't talk about this. And I could go out and show people all the cool ideas I had. The problem was that it was something worse than an NDA that comes by buying a house. It's called work. You cut your lawn, you fix everything, you do, you renovate. It's, it's an endless part of the of work. Okay, so fine, I thought. I work, I have a reasonable amount of money. Other people buy, build, build IoT stuff. I can buy them, and then I can do cool solutions on top of these that doesn't take as much time as just building them, and I'll be fine. So I went online, I went to the internet, and I wrote, and I found, and I emailed, and I asked, and I went to forums, and I bought this huge box of objects. And I came home, and, I, and my, my, my fiancé said to me, Carl, what is this? I said, it's the future. <laughs> and I, I opened it up, and it was filled with nice little boxes and trinkets and everything. And well, she wasn't that impressed, but and I started hooking everything up, and and after a few weeks of trying to make everything work with each other and all that stuff, I wrote this speech. So I would like to tell you guys about what I think is good practices to think about when you find yourself in an IoT project. We're going to be high and low. We're going to talk about the teams that you work with and all the way down to specific hardware implementation ideas that can be a good thing to think about. So I want to empower you with a toolbox of things that you can use when somebody is being, well, let's say, not optimally clever. And hopefully, this will mean that I will not no longer spend a full weekend trying to get something to connect to my wireless network. All right, here we go. First thing the people around you. People around you are very important. The team you work with is extraordinarily important. But who can tell me what is the similarity between Santa Claus, an IoT expert, and the Easter Bunny? Very good. A round of applause for these gentlemen. So IoT expert doesn't exist, which is very weird, because my LinkedIn feed begs to differ. My LinkedIn feed is filled with IoT experts, which for me is a very strange sounding term. It's like saying, I'm a full stack expert. And yet to this day, I have never seen somebody call themselves a full stack expert. And I've also never seen somebody who is an expert at CSS, HTML5, and database optimization. 
I've seen people know both, but I never met an expert in it. Just the same way as I never met somebody who was an expert in hardware design, hardware programming, hardware optimization, network communication protocols, network systems, business intelligence, big data, um, graphical and front-end stuff, and UX and design and plastic printing and everything. It's impossible to be an IoT expert. But it comes down to the definition. And I mean, most people will call themselves an IoT expert if they're really good at some part of IoT. And we should allow them to do that. But we must be aware that one of the person in our team might think that they're an IT expert, but we need to make sure that they also understand what their role is in our team. For example, I will give you a very good story. Many years ago, I worked for a company I will not name. And in this team, there was this amazing hardware developer. Truly godlike. He could write assembly code that no C compiler could ever rival if you keep given enough time. And that was the thing. We didn't have budget, we didn't have time for this. And he was like, I can do this better. Yes, you can do that. But I can write it in C a hundred times faster. There is trade-offs, there is understanding these things, right? So we must be understanding what is our role and where can we achieve maximum efficiency with our expertise. Just because you're an expert at microprocessors doesn't mean I know diddly squat about business intelligence or implementing business intelligence rules. That makes sense to everybody? Great. Let's talk about users. I like users. They buy my products. They will buy your products. So users are good. Um, what is the best way to find a user very early in your development process? You go to your friends and family. I tend to put all the things that I build and all the things that I do and show them to my fiance. Like, play around with this. Because that means that I'm using this age-old engineering technology known as the wife appreciation factor. <laughs> but, I mean, we're not, we're not only have, like, engineers can of course be females, there are a lot of really, really, really good engineers. So we rename it to the marriage interference factor until we realize that most people aren't actually married, so now it's the spouse acceptance factor. So pick whatever one you like. Basically, it means what you can get away with at home. Like, is it too ugly? Is it too hard to use? Is it too much administration? Does it go off with a bad beeping sound if you use the hairdryer at 7.30 in the morning before she had her first coffee? That sort of thing. I prefer a small test for you, so hands in the air again as soon as you see. Okay, has this picture high WAF? In that case, raise your hand. Is this a high WAF approval picture? I take it that you don't think so. This one? Very good. Depends a little bit on who you live with, but yeah. This is kind of like the hardest one. This one? Very good. It is not high WAF. We might think it is but we are wrong. <laughs> and the final one, which should be pretty clear to most people. Oh, well, very good, 50% had right. You know, it, it, it's high WAF. Uh, they team tend to like Apple products. So why should you care? Why does this matter to you? Well, because you need users that can give you feedback very, very quickly on an idea. This will help you not do stupid things. Like your spouse or your user or your whoever you pick can be the most interested and motivated product owner you have ever met. Let me give you an example. A couple of years ago, uh, when IoT was just starting off, I met this investor who had a brilliant idea. He had a food company that did food deliveries. You know, you get a grocery bag with things. And he wanted to be able to, his, to refrigerate to tell him are they out? Do they have half? Do they need a small milk, a big milk? Do they need a lot of cheese, a little cheese? What do they need? And his idea for this was, let's put in scales in the under everything. And I talked to my girlfriend, I said, this is a wonderful idea. And she went like, no, you're stupid. We have a lovely relationship. And she walked over to the fridge, and she opened it. And she showed me that... You don't put things on scales, 
A refrigerator is a stackable storage space. You stack things on top of each other, and you don't know what people put in there. I mean, if you have kids over, a refrigerator is a war zone. So by connecting with your users, you can have very early information about what is wrong and what is right with your product. And this is something that is one of the most key elements to getting funding. Because for me, that water bottle I showed you, we all laughed about, because we're engineers, we're smart people. We would never have produced it. But if instead of using our bias, our bias for products, our bias for intelligence, and how we think and what we do, and we would have showed it to a few users who said, no, you know what? I'd pay $50 for that. We have a baseline. We know that actually everybody we talk to would like to buy this product. And they also told us roughly the amount of money they'd be ready to spend to have it, which can give us all sorts of constraints on our building process, like how much can they pay for it? What can the hardware cost? What can we do? When will this be something that we actually make money on? So let's talk about user experience. Don't worry, we're going to get to a lot more hardware in a minute. This is also important. Hug your user experience, people. All right. So one of the first things I did when I bought my big box of things, I wanted to connect them in my house. They required a really, really good Wi-Fi. Because I read on the forums that they were a bit jittery, that they really needed good Wi-Fi. So I bought, or I started looking at things, and I found this. This is the Ubiquiti access point, which works very, very well with a lot of items. It has high throughput and stuff like that. But the majority of routers that I saw, which luckily does not translate to the majority of IoT projects, look like this. And I can't tell, like, 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 like um, what the hell? What are you doing there? Get away. Thank you. So, I mean, I can't tell, like, is this practical? Is it mating season for routers? I mean, I have no idea. I know perfectly well everything about why antennas in that configura configuration is a good idea. But who would have that in a house? I mean, sure, I know, I, I'd love it in you know, my office space, because it looks kind of spacey and cool, but it's not a practical thing that people would like not react to compared to you know, a bland white thing that looks like a fire alarm in the roof. It's just you know, a very good thing to think about, that this is also user experience. How will my thing look if it's placed in an office building or a home or in somebody's pocket? We have to think about this stuff. We don't have, want to be like these people. So we want it to be anonymous and not flamboyant. We do not want it to be getting everybody's attention unless we're actually building a product that we want people to see. All right. So let's talk about honesty and respect. This was the third thing that I discovered. So I went and bought this router put everything up, and started getting data. I hooked up my thermostat, I have digital thermostat, to not the good one, but another product, <laughs> if, you know which, if you know your thermostats. And it started reporting data, and it actually worked pretty well, until I wanted to do analytics, because I wanted to learn more about analytics. I wanted to get the data and compare it to stuff like, was a door open or not? Was a window open or not? Stuff like that. And it turns out that data in the cloud means accessible to them, not to me. Many, many of the products that I bought did not have an API. They weren't able to give us information or feedback. So basically, when I called them, they said, you can have our wonderful report. It's available in our iOS app. All right, I was using Windows Phone. You think they had an app? Nobody has a Windows Phone app. And I started going through that. I want this information, and the only endpoint is an app. Is this even an IoT object? I think not. 
I don't think that it is an IoT object, because it's impossible to communicate with anything around it. It cannot interact. It is a silo. It's a closed-off device. You understand what I'm saying? Because you could never get that data out of it. You can never actually make something, grab the data, do an analysis, and tell us something about this. So in a way, we need to give them all the tools to build actual IoT. And this is hard, this is difficult, but we need to relinquish. I mean, data is the new oil, everybody's saying that, but if data is the new oil, then the Internet of Things are going to be the new oil fields, because that's where you put in all your information. All right, what does the NSA and the sex toy we vibe have in common? <laughs> they both fuck you over, okay. So I'm gonna have to bleep that. It's a very good answer, but not true. <laughs> With the V vibe, it's more of a vibrating experience. No, um, so somebody else said they are, they're spying on you. So apparently, somebody who bought this product hooked up their phone while using it to uh, Wireshark and noticed that as soon as he turned it on, it started to send data to an anonymous server. It was collecting uh, what times it was used by the second. It was collecting in what settings it was used it. And some people have also reported that some versions were reporting by, via the GPS on the phone, since it used Bluetooth, where it was being used. This is a kind of an intrusive thing, and it's not honesty, because it says nowhere. It says that it has some sort of um, dynamic link for service updates and per performance issues. I have no idea what performance issues they're talking about, but... <laughs> this is not honesty. Like, spying on your users is never okay. And while you might need the data, focus groups is a lot better way. I mean, nobody's going to object if you say, hi, I have a sex toy, would you like to be part of my focus group? Wait a minute, people might. <laughs> anyway, so the point is that we need to be honest about this. Don't worry, we're very, very close to the hardware, techie stuff now. But this is also important. We need to be open and honest. We need to build a genuine IoT network who will require trust. Why does a lot of people hate Nest now? Does anybody know? Do you know does everybody know what Nest is? All right, so it's like 10 people. All right, Nest is a smart thermostat that analyzes like the temperature when you're home and if you're going home and when you're home and saves you money basically by Turning down the heat when you're not there, turning up the heat when you're there. Quite effective. Works relatively well. They bought a product called Revolve, which was a smart hub thing. Um, because since a lot of things are using apps and it's very hard to communicate, we get smart hubs that help us interact with all of these things that are otherwise very closed off. They cost $300 to buy this product, which at least for me uh, is a lot of money. $300 is a lot of money. Um, and then they kind of thought that nobody's buying this product. Let's cancel it. And didn't really offer a good replacement either for regular users. So regular users who could do nothing with it had a $300 hardware, just sat there, did nothing. I mean, who would sell something like that? Like who, who would do that? There we go. <laughs> Don't give your customers the short end of the stick. Like, plan for this. What would happen if we are bankruptcy? Can you use your hardware product or products? Can we do something with this? And a very easy way to do this is simply just go to a product meeting. I do this all the time. And unplug it from the network. People hate you, but they start to see your point. Kill the Wi-Fi, what happens? Make sure you know. This is turning into a quality assurance talk. Ooh. Let's talk about hardware. So, a lot of people own an Arduino, especially a lot of people in this room. And a lot of people 
play around with them and build products and become really good at them. So how many people have an idea for an IoT startup? Hands up. Nobody. Seriously, people make $150,000 on a water bottle with a chip in, and you're not ready to cash in. I mean, I, I, I'm surprised. Verily. So, okay, how many people have an IoT business idea? Doesn't have to be good. I'm not going to ask you about it. You can lie. Oh, that's more hands. Good. So, if you have an idea, a very good way to prototype this is to use these platforms. I used to be very opposed. Like when the Arduino came out, I was, you know, what? Why should it be so easy for them? It was so hard for us. And suddenly you, you got a programmer and everything, with, you put in a USB cable, it just worked. And now they're starting to include like step-by-step -step debugging and things to these two, so we can't even have that for ourselves. Now you put JavaScript on them and that compiles to work with them, so anybody can do this. And that's a good thing. That is a good thing because it means that you can build a prototype that will enable you to show something to an investor, get your first investment round, get $150,000. You might not be able to make money on your first prototype. You might be losing money on your first set of devices that uses these simpler things. But it will give you enough money and enough connections to hire somebody who knows a little bit about implementing, say, an, uh, an ATX Mega, which is a very simple, relatively cheap microcontroller, that is also the one that's being used with a bootloader on the Arduino. So the Arduino is basically just a platform around an AT Mega processor, a microcontroller, with a bootloader that helps us write code. So everything we can do on that is possible to do on much, much smaller. And if you buy thousands of these, they're dirt cheap. You see what I'm saying? That I'm trying to make get, I don't know why I'm trying to get myself fired, but more or less you people can use Arduino or other devices, prove your entire concept, and then move on to actually hire people that wants to do hardware design and can more or less port your code, improve it a little bit for microprocessor stuff like that, to work with this. That's kind of a new deal breaker. That's kind of like the new thing of IoT. That's going to change things for us. And you have, you have all sorts of these. You have built-in Wi-Fi, built-in Bluetooth. You don't have to do a thing if you don't want to. It's just a matter of how much money you want to spend. And if you're actually in a project building something, I'm going to guess that the same thing applies here. If you can shave off two hours, a th um, let's say 500 extra slots, it's not going to do a damn thing, right? Well, probably not. All right, so let's talk about building battery device power, battery power devices that doesn't suck. How many here own an, uh, a battery powered device that sucks? Okay, that was the first 100% hand up we had today. All right, so we all, all own battery powered devices that suck. They suck out the power. I charge my phones, I charge my headset, I charge everything. But if you want to build things and actually make them work, you have to think about this thing. So let me give you an example. So the Arduino, if you put the Uno on a 9-volt battery, you have less than a day's power, doing no work, just idling. If you put the Arduino Pro Mini on a 9-volt battery, you have 10 days of power. And if you take the same Arduino Pro Mini, you remove the lead, and you change the power a supply unit to actually be something that is a little bit more effective and doesn't burn away that much power, you have 3.5 years. So we haven't actually made any difference in the code, we haven't changed the battery, we only changed, we removed the lead and a little hardware thing. But what else did we do? How did we suddenly jump from 10 days to three and a half years? Like what is the magic thing here? Uh, so how many people know about interrupts? Hands up. Very many. Um, um, give yourself a round of applause. That's very good. Um, so the sleep interrupt is severely underused in a lot of IoT devices, and I have no idea why. So if you start looking at that, they never go to sleep and they have LEDs. 
Having a LED means that you have something that needs to be powered on, needs to be controlled. Not using the sleep interrupt means that you, can, you basically are missing out on using almost no power. One other thing we talked about further was WAF, like wife appreciation factor. When you have to go and change a battery every month or every three weeks, people forget, people get tired, people get annoyed. That is not a good thing to make future business. When you have to go and change a battery every 3.5 years, people forget where they put the things, buy new ones, and that's a very good way to make business. All right. Another thing that is very important to actually have battery power is using correct communication protocols, uh, which is also actually beneficial for the development process. So um, for the non-techies here, let's talk about this. The difference between these, these are all more or less used to communicate between server and the microcontroller, I'll say that. Um, I'd like to show them off this picture. So this is like the amount of data required to send the same amount of information between the microcontroller and the server. All right, NQP is a relatively respected mustache. MQDT is a very small, light tango. It's a tango rabat, as we say in Sweden or in France, I don't know. And Stomp is one of those you know, hefty American ones. And this is HTTP. <laughs> now, MQTT is a telemetry transport protocol. So it's basically built to transport telemetry data. It's TCP-based, it's asynchronous, it's used pub-subscribe things. It is very simple. I mean, HTTP is much, much more advanced. And it takes a lot longer time to actually establish this connection if every time you go up from sleep in a microcontroller, but despite that, it still has a 4.5 less battery use than HTTP. And if you're chunking data, so you're sending a lot of data at the same time, it is extraordinarily more powerful. Because you can do, like I think it's like 27,000 MQTT packets at the same time you send 4,000 something HTTP ones at the same data. So if, if you're doing a lot of transmission, this is starting to become really big. AMQP is roughly the same thing. It is slightly more complicated. More, also more used, so there's a lot more help. Uh, Microsoft seemed to favor it in front of MQTT for the service bus, the IoT hub, and that sort of stuff. Uh, but it's become very, very cumbersome. If you see, check out the documentation, it's like 600 pages of, of like, how to implement them. Peter, Peter Hinchens famously left the MQP project because it simply was too complex, and it wasn't what he wanted it to be. It's kind of a good thing to think about. So let's recap. The smaller protocol the less power we need, because it takes less time from waking up, sending our data, and going back to sleep. All right, this means that we also can put some constraints, some ideas on the back-end people. If we have good back-end, fast things that do those asynchronous jobs and stuff like that, we save power for the users. Radio frequency and Wi-Fi support different protocols. So do we want to use Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi is a very power-consuming thing compared to, let's say, having a radio frequency thing. We're going to look at something called field gateways in a moment, and we're going to see the difference between these things. So you also need to think about that stuff. And last but not least, a very small CPU is power-efficient and is useful for these things, but it has a very hard time using big protocols and stuff like that because it takes time for it to chunk it up and, and build it up, and it's not built for that. All right. Design with failure in mind. You need to think about the things can actually fail. Oh, my third is bad. So designing things like this means that we have to consider things can go badly. Things can end badly. Uh, I'm going to give you an example here, very, very simple implementation of a power button that lights up a lamp. This is a very common scenario using most of the things that I've seen. You have a Usually, you start with having a regular button that controls your lamp, you disconnect it from the lamp, you connect the power to something that controls the lamp instead, and then you just control the thing that controls the power with the light button. Okay, right? perfect, but what happens if it breaks? Suddenly, you have no idea. Okay, so if we're gonna design this for failure, we might think, all right, let me put, put, a, put, a bu put the control on the button, so the button will still work like it used to do, but I can now control the button, and I can get a signal to the microcontroller 
saying that the, the button is on or off and stuff like that. Very simple change in how we think, but we should think that even if the microcontroller breaks or if the internet is down, we should be able to control it or people will hate us. Like, yeah, spent four hours in the dark yesterday because the cloud service was down. A lot of fun. You know, it's just not a lot of things people want to do. So it's a good thing to think about. We can even add more things. Like we can add sensors that tell us if the light is on or off. Because if something is telling us that the button is off but the light is on, well, we're either having a house fire or a technical problem. Both things are things we might want to know about. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about scaling. Like a lot of companies do this poorly because they do hardware systems that communicate directly with cloud services. So um, it's a viable thing that you can do. It depends on your use case. But for most cases, this will not be a good thing. You need to design with failure in mind or in your alternative placements. So let's say that the internet goes down. Suddenly, we lose all the data in these. And if we have important data on one of these, like maybe one of our first things that we want to do is implement some sort of logging. We want to have data stored to a, a SD card or something like that, that we can retrieve the data later and, and just get it all pumped up to the internet when the internet connection is back. Uh, another solution we could do is implement a field gateway. A field gateway is actually a good idea for many, many reasons. And we do this a lot, especially with um, company products when we put a lot of sensors in a factory and things like that. So a field gateway is basically just a computer with a small MQTT server or something like that that can receive data over a radio, which is a lot less uh, power, constriction, power, power consuming than Wi-Fi, which gives us just um, a better way of, of storing this. And we can also add uh, Wi-Fi to this, so we can have both Ethernet and Wi-Fi. If something happens to the cable or the Wi-Fi, we can still communicate with the cloud and stuff like that. Um, and we can continue this. We can build this out to have two field gateways. It's not a problem. We can do synchronization with Raspberry Pis or any mi microcomputer. It's very, very cheap and gives us very, very much happier customers. We can add mobile data networks to it and be, be very, very securely. We can even, we can even scale it up to, to have dual cloud servers, cloud systems. Still, things will not cost a lot, but it will be very effective for us. All right? As people might have seen, this is a blue screen, but I'm running a Mac, so failure would look differently. But I wanted to have failure. But should it have happened, I have this presentation, not a computer. Why? Because I, I did what? I designed with failure in mind. All right? It's a very, very important key concept. And it might be the concept of becoming the next big thing or something that people hate you for. So this is also something that I've noticed that a lot of people have trouble getting into. That this out of sight is out of mind. Uh, the Internet of Things is supposed to be this unobtrusive idea where people things just help you. It's like your washing machine automatically orders new detergent because you're out, stuff like that. But people still seem very, very, very happy putting all this stuff like in the middle of a room. Here it is. Well, we can do so much better things with that. We can put them in, um, in roofs. A lot of people don't see what they're accustomed to. If you put up like 10 fire alarms, people would not notice that because it's something that our brain thinks it's supposed to be there. Uh, if you look under any table anywhere, there is gum. <laughs> and if you would design a device that is actually very, very suitable to be under a table, that works a lot. Our focus groups tell us that this is something that they really enjoy. This was easy to place, it's easy to get power to it, easy to find a good location for them. This is something that people were happy. And a few weeks ago, I was listening to this guy who was doing a presentation of a product that he wanted us to buy. And he said, oh, this is great. It's like When you're building the house, you put it inside the wall, and it collects data about your insulation and tells you like options when you should perhaps insulate your house better. OK. So putting something inside a wall can be tempting. But it's going to be there forever. Anybody heard of the Nexus 7? It, it explodes. Think about being the guy who does the callback for, yeah, you know the thing that we put in six of your walls? 
We need that back. I mean, it's not going to work. Do not put things inside walls. It's not, not useful, it's not good, it's not smart. There are a lot of things that you can do if you really need something on a wall that is inside a wall, but you need a hole in the wall and stuff like that. You could put up small, like these fuse box things, and people would not care about it in the same way. So, but you might be tempted to do it, but don't put things inside walls. It will be there forever. So, one good thing about so many people of you, how many people here are front end developers? Actually, quite a few. That's very good. I like you. I love that you're here because you are going to have so much work in the IoT industry. Because uh, IoT industry, with people like me, old farts that really never cared about JavaScript or understanding frameworks and stuff like that, I have discovered that the same problems that we are doing in computer science is the same problems we have in the Internet of Things. Like, for example, I would tell you administration. Um, a lot of times I come to teams, yeah, and now I hook up the thing to the USB, and I program it, and then I go to IKEA and wait, because it takes a long time. But we, we in the, in the front end, we have front end build pipelines, we have Gulp, we have Bower, we have package managers, uh, we have automated continuous integration systems, we have automated testing, we have so much stuff. And we are far behind in the hardware industry. But I noticed when we bring in people, like we brought in a front end guy to do some amazing looking graphs. Where are you continuous integration? They start asking these questions. And the team start, yeah, maybe we could build that and become so much, so much better. Um, so you guys are needed in this industry, and you're going to do a lot. But also think about this. that We need to also have automation at the client side. If we put out a device that the customer needs to update themselves, let's say via an app or something, make it quick, make it easy, make it smart. For example, I have a lamp at my home which requires to be on when I'm updating it. It takes three hours to update it. <laughs> Honey, do not turn off the bedroom light. <laughs> we are updating. <laughs> Apparently not a very positive thing to say in the bedroom. So think about that. Um, there are many, many ways to implement this. A three hour update cycle for a microprocessor should be impossible. Uh, and also things like, like basic splitting up of responsibilities, like actually doing adapter patterns, queue patterns, consumer patterns, stuff like that. I see backends written by people who are hardware developers, and I'd rather not ever do that again. How many backend developers do we have here? Excellent. How many of you that are backend developers know about the adapter pattern? Oh, I just love being in Poland. People are so smart. A consumer pattern. Excellent. I did the same talk for my hardware group, and they were like, one guy. Yeah, I heard of it. And this is a very simple thing to set up. And it gives you a, a very high viability of, of the consumers you can have and what the, the things you can offer. Let's say if we had this pattern. You remember the people that I called about, I want I wanted to export my data. No, we don't have the mobile app. But with a solution like this, they could just add another consumer, giving me an API that just gives me data in simple JSON format. It wouldn't have taken them a day to write it, and it would have been a lot more happier customer. So if you think about this stuff and actually use software processes instead of, of just running quickly and listening to the hardware guy, you can do a lot of stuff with it. All right, so always design for you know, high WAF value. It will be the better system. Keep it hidden but accessible. Select the device more suitable for the job. Design with failure in mind. And if it can't be replaced, it will be there forever. And with most software systems, the end goal is scalability and adaptability. These are the things that I tend to tell all the people that I work with and do things, and it actually gives us better products. And I really want to see better products because my house is still as dumb as a doornail. But trust me, I will work on it. And hopefully next year I'll be back and I will tell you of how amazing 2016 and 17 was because the Polish industry was there. So I want to leave you with these words. IoT is not just a product connected to the internet. It's a representation of a physical object on the internet. Respect that and build a representation of this physical object. 
give us the data it's able to give us and let us consume it and do things with it. And the simplest of ideas can become great products. Uh, my name is Carl Henrik Nilsson. I'm a software consultant for Threaten37. I hope a lot of people heard of us. I'm a Microsoft Most Valuable Professional. Most of the stuff I do is hard development, backend stuff. So if you have any questions, we have about five minutes left, I think. Five minutes left. So thanks for listening. Let's hear some questions. All right, any questions? I'm not going to ask my own questions. <laughs> it's lunchtime, yeah, I know. Horrible, horrible lunchtime. It's still better to be before lunch than after lunch. All right, so if you want to have any stuff of this, I am Carl Henrik on GitHub, and I will put everything this online, and I think also at the dev day, we'll put it all up there. Thanks for listening, guys.